Good. Good morning, all. Thank you for coming today. I'm Lori Aratani. I'm a transportation reporter here at the Washington Post, and I'd like to introduce our panelists today. We have Sean Kennedy, who's Senior Vice President of Global Government Affairs at Airlines for America. We have Paul Hudson, President of FlyersRights.org and Kevin M. Burke, President and CEO of Airport Council International of North America. Now before we begin, I'd like to remind the audience in the room and online that you can tweet your questions to us, hashtag taking flight. Please do, we'd like you to participate. That makes the discussion really rich. Um, and we'll try and work those in as we chat. So I think these days you can't really have a conversation about the aviation industry without talking about the passenger experience. Um, it's been more than a year since the infamous United Dr. David Dow incident. And there has been some progress. Overbooking is down, um, bumping is down, and United even made good on that pledge to give out that $10,000 flight voucher. But one thing you have to wonder if you're a traveler, and I bet many of you are traveling this year, um, this summer is enough being done. Sean, you want to start us off? Great. Well, first, thank you. Thank you for the Washington Post for, uh, for bringing us together <laughs> today. Uh, on the notion of customer service and what does the customer expect, what's great about this industry is you have so many more carriers that are participating from not only the larger carriers, American, United, Delta, but you have the smaller ones, the ultra low cost carriers like Spirit. They're each offering a different product aimed at a different segment of society, and that's why we have record numbers of people traveling. To answer your question on things like overbooking, uh, if you look at the numbers for where we were last year, it was 6.2 customers were uh, overbooked, were bumped per 100,000 uh, flyers. This first quarter of this year, 1.2, 1.2 passengers, which is an all-time low. What it shows is that the industry was immediate and quick in responding to the incidents of last year. It was unacceptable. Everyone acknowledges across the board that mistakes were made, but what's more important is that the industry took corrective actions immediately, and you're seeing that in this new record low number of people uh, that have been uh, denied seating. Paul, I, I, I'd imagine well, you might make an argument. Yeah, I have a somewhat different take. Um, I think almost a billion people saw that infamous Dr. Dow video. If you go on our website, you'll see uh, there's lots of other videos uh, showing passenger abuse. Um, and if you recall the incident, uh, the, the CEO um, initially defended the airline, uh, saying that the removal was, was okay. It was, they did everything proper. Um, uh, the police officers all swore that they did everything proper. But when the video came out, everything changed. That wasn't because of voluntary um, uh, action by the airlines. I think social media has, has uh, really uh, played a major part in the reforms here. Well, I think Sean's done a really good job of uh, explaining um, the, the challenges there. It, it was disappointing. It's, it's disappointing every time it happens, and it's encouraging to hear that the airlines are addressing those issues in particular, and to hear that those numbers have gone down, uh, that's good. But I think it's something we have to be diligent, we as an industry, uh, have to be diligent. Mm -hmm. And I know right now lots of us are watching a lot of the action on Capitol Hill, particularly if you're interested in airlines in the aviation industry. It's FAA reauthorization time. Um, I'm, there's some interesting provisions in there, and I know there's always a tug and pull between how much, how much regulation is enough, sh how much regulation should be. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, all your thoughts on, on some of the provisions that are in there. They're talking about things including a minimum seat size, um, an aviation consumer advocate, more disclosure of, of fees that folks would pay as part of their ticket. And I'd be curious if you all feel this is something that moves the, moves the industry forward in making it more customer friendly and responsive, or if you have a different view. Um, Paul, do you want to start? Yes, I, I guess broadly speaking, uh, we favor uh, reasonable <laughs> regulation coupled with more competition. Um, after deregulation, it's been the mantra that competition will solve everything. Problem is with mergers, we now have very little competition. <clears throat> Seats is a case in point. Um, in every other area of, of transportation, seats are getting bigger. Only in airlines are they getting smaller. People are getting bigger. We now have three quarters <laughs> of the population of the United States that's it's rated as obese or overweight. 
and the, the, the one quarter that are still considered normal are squeezed by the others. <laughs> now, we, we brought a case, uh, had to go to the uh, appeals court, and a year ago the court said, the FAA, you need to really look at regulating seat size. But so far we haven't heard anything. And as a result, the airlines are continuing to shrink seats, and there's really no limit because there is no regulation of any kind right now on seat size. Well, there is regulation on seat size, obviously, for safety. So the, number one, the FAA has safety requirements in to ensure that people can safely evacuate the plane in the event of an incident. What you're referring to is should, should there be a comfort standard? Should they regulate how cushy the, com the, the, the chairs are? One of the most popular questions I get is, why isn't there an airline that just has every seat um, like a first class seat? And the answer is, if that existed, the, there'd be an airline doing it. But the problem is, for virtually every customer right now, what they're looking for is cost. Uh, if you look at the airlines that have the most growth right now, the ones that are adding the most seats, it's Spirit. People don't pick Spirit because they think they're going to have a comfortable experience. People pick Spirit because they, what they care about, that particular segment of the population, um, they want the lowest price possible. And Spirit um, offers that. We have this new market. What's exciting is that if you are a family that cares about, you can pick what you want. You can get a product that if you care about comfort, there's an airline product that offers that. If you want convenience, um, everyone's going to have the same level of safety. All of the, the industry remains safe, but you can pick sort of what, you can pick and choose what's right for you. We haven't had that historically. It's one of the things that deregulation has done. To answer your question, one of the challenges that we have in the FAA bill is a provision that's, um, and it was mentioned in the last panel, uh, it's called the Fair Fees Act, and it would eliminate, it would allow the government to re-regulate the pricing of certain products um, that airlines offer. What's been great about deregulation is, is that you have a highly segmented structure now where different carriers offer a different experience and different products, and some charge for things and some don't. Passengers vote with their wallets every day. That's why there are more people, that's why we're at record levels flying right now. Removing that is going to completely upend that system. Excuse me, but... <laughs> there is no regulation for seat size. And every year, um, the airline industry um, people have a convention or two where they come up with new seats, and they're always smaller. I don't know if you've seen this, but you go on our website, there's a new one called the Skyrider. Now, I'm not you know, a fan of it, but it involves sitting like this. You can get three times as many people in the same space with the Skyrider. Now, this is about, and the, the seat makers are selling it this way, this is not about consumer choice. This is about generating more revenue for airlines. The idea is if you squeeze people into torture class, then you can force them into buying more expensive seats. And, you know, we had some things like that on the Titanic. It didn't work out so well. But leaving that aside, we are getting now where some of the seating arrangements being proposed are without seats whatsoever. And all we're saying is we need to have some reasonable standard. You know, he mentioned fees. Um, well, one of the problems with your regulation is that there is no definition of airline tickets. And so arguably you could have um, airfare for a dollar and everything else could be extra. Uh, Spirit has over 70 optional fees. This is a um, exception or a, a loophole that you can drive a 747 through. And so what's happening is you get um, low fares advertised, but they don't include the full price of the ticket. And the purpose of that by the airlines is to make price shopping difficult to impossible, because the airlines hate price shopping. But, but yeah. I, I want to I get back to this, because this is clearly a topic that the audience is engaged in it that we are. But I also want to give Kevin a chance to talk. And I know one thing, it's not just about the airplane and getting on there. Um, airports are a big part of this. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about infrastructure in the transportation world. We hear it about 
roads and bridges. If you live in New York and DC, you hear it about your subway systems. But I don't know that we always hear a lot about airports and infrastructure and the state of infrastructure at airports. And I think Kevin might have something to say about that. Well, Maybe Laurie, first of all, thank you for uh, having me here. Second of all, yes, I have lots to say <laughs> about airports. Um, uh, infrastructure is probably our most important issue. <clears throat> we have airports on average, the terminals are 40 years old. Um, we have about 840 million people going through U.S. airports last year. Those airports were designed for about half that amount of traffic. So uh, what we need to do in U.S. airports is make them a 21st century airports to enhance the customer experience. Really, it's all about the customers, it's about customer service. It's being able to move the customer from the time they enter the airport <clears throat> when they go through TSA to go to the terminal to buy lunch, to buy a shirt, buy a tie, um, buy a, whatever they want to buy, get onto one of Sean's aircraft and get to where they need to go. Uh, the infrastructure we have today uh, doesn't enhance that experience. Um, so uh, airports need to modernize, and some are further ahead than others. But our goal is to make certain that uh, the transportation system, our sector, is modernized 21st century. That means both the airlines and the airports have to be modernized to make certain that the customer has a fabulous experience, um, both going through security, making sure there's enough TSA officers to be able to handle that, that technology exists to be able to handle that part of it, both in the front of the airport with TSA and inbound international with Customs and Border Protection. And then while they're at our airports, that they have a great customer experience so when they get on their planes to go where they're going, they're not stressed and they feel really good about being where they are. Um, long lines do not help airports. Uh, two years ago, when we had uh, those long lines, uh, social media lit up and with pictures of long lines, and it wasn't about the great service when they got past the line, it was about the lines themselves, which we had nothing to do with. And we worked together with the airlines to help solve that problem. But more needs to be done. We, we think, uh, I agree with a lot of what you said, but um, the part that is left out by the uh, airport lobby is we need not just fancier airports, we need more airports. The United States is the only first world country in the world, and probably even second and third world country, that has built zero new airports for decades. And we are favoring repeal of some of the laws and regulations that prohibit, for instance, private airports, that prohibit the United States government from operating an airport. So what we have now, and the number one complaint of passengers traditionally, is delay. Congestion delays is a major part of that. And 60% of the congestion, de conge excuse me, congestion delays are from one place, New York City. It has three airports, all controlled by the Port Authority, which is a monopoly. We need a fourth airport there. Now, the locals don't want a fourth airport. The, the Port Authority likes their uh, monopoly. They don't want a third, uh, fourth airport. Chicago two airports owned by the city of Chicago, major cash cow. They have lobbied against a third airport for, for decades successfully. Um, we need to build more airports. The amount that's being talked about of $12 billion for improving airports is a drop in the bucket. Um, so we, we favor, at the very least, a fourth airport for New York, uh, a third airport of Chicago, and probably another one for Atlanta. Can I, can I jump in here on this? Um, I agree with what you're saying here, but I think we need to begin to, we have to start with modernizing the ones we have now. And then if in fact the local communities decide that they need another airport, whether it be JFK, whether New York or Atlanta or LA or San Francisco, then we go to the next level. But immediately, and we know how long that takes to do. It's not like when we go to China and the Chinese rules are a little bit different, they can build an airport pretty quickly. In the United States, there are regulations. And of course, we are supportive of, of ridding the airport business of unnecessary regulations. We let the Trump administration know that. But in terms of, of your answer there, yes, we'd like to have new airports, but I do think um, we need to take those airports we have today, modernize them, um, make sure that the passenger experience is first rate, and then if we can build new airports, let's do it. Problem is, we'll all be gone by the time that happens. <laughs> John, do you have any thoughts on this? No, I mean, it's, it's Kevin's right. I'm not sure about the 12 billion. I mean, in general, if you look at the top 30 airports and the number, and Kevin knows these numbers better than I, but it's it's about 300 billion dollars of development is underway right now, or has just been completed. 
Airlines are a big part of that. We work well with uh, the airports on that. They're sort of our landlords in a sense. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good relationship because obviously we need that infrastructure. We need that infrastructure. Airports and, and airlines, it's a completely symbiotic relationship. We need a place to land. The notion of creating more airports isn't something that a lot of communities are saying to us right now. It's more, how do we make sure that there are adequate gates? How do we make sure? Um, another big issue that hasn't been touched on is just what the infrastructure in the sky. Air traffic control reform. We're still using 1950s era radar technology, which is very safe but very inefficient. Uh, we're one of the only modernized countries that isn't, that's still using that backward technology. We can do a lot better. We have, airports have $100 billion of, of needs in the next five years. That's up 35% from two years ago when we surveyed our members. That's $100 billion, $20 billion a year. Of that $20 billion, uh, $10 billion of that is handled by um, certain funding through certain government programs, the, uh, uh, and, but we $10 billion short. So we have to focus on making airports modern uh, be, by being able to change the funding structure to allow airports to make decisions that are best for local communities, not for what the FAA tells us to do, on, on, but, but for local communities. That's when, in fact, airports will begin to grow and we get the funding, working with uh, Senator Blunt and Senator Cantwell and others in the Senate and the House to be able to make that happen. So more modern airports, um, more competition. Let's, uh, one thing I did want to talk about is competition. Um, Sean talked about this, the rise, and if you've ever phoned Spirit, Allegiant, these, you had low-cost carriers, now you have ultra-low-cost carriers. I don't know mm -hmm. if we get to ultra-ultra-low-cost carriers and what that means, but even so, about four, air, four airlines control about 80% of the market. So what can we say about competition and what it will mean for consumers and, and flyers for airports? Uh, whoever wants to start with that one. First of all, competition is good. It's what drives America. Uh, it will help the passenger experience, it will lower fares, um, and it also will help airports develop into 21st century airports. Um, your number is correct. Uh, about 85% of the people who fly in the United States are carried by four airlines. Uh, I don't consider that competition. Uh, when you enter the market of ultra low carriers, uh, we welcome that because we're not just talking about large hub airports. We represent medium and small airports that on a, the hub and spoke system service the larger airports. So the more competition that we have in the United States for passengers to make a choice, uh, the more those local airports will be able to take people from small places like Dubuque to the Chicago, from St. Louis to Atlanta, to make those type of connections. The more choice Americans have, the better travel experience they have based upon the type of airline they want to fly. If they want to fly Allegiant, that's great, but we need to have more of them. That helps the U.S. airport structure. It allows passengers to fly in different places, and it helps local economies. The one thing I've learned in this job is an airport is a magnet for business development around the country. If you have an airport that's a good airport, it's modernized, companies want to locate there because one good reason. They can get in and out both on a supply basis for cargo as well as passengers. So competition is good. I'm glad to hear that, that, that you favor that, and perhaps you favor getting rid of the uh, antitrust exemptions that airports have. And perhaps if, if uh, airlines were truly in favor of competition, they would be in favor of getting rid of the antitrust exemptions that allow them to control international, at least two-thirds of international flights through joint ventures. But uh, really, we think there are three things that need to be done to make uh, competition a reality. Um, one, we need to allow more, um, more foreign competition. And there is, there is a bill out by uh, Congressman Bratt called Free to Fly that would uh, reduce the uh, strong restrictions. The United States has the, the strongest restrictions of any country for any foreign carrier. Um, you cannot have a foreign subsidiary here. You cannot um, own more than 25% if you're a foreign uh, company of a U.S.-based carrier. You cannot control a U.S.-based carrier. Now, these are Cold War era things, and there is certainly national security interest. But if you've flown in Europe recently, you'll know that, that it often costs more to take a cab ride to the airport than a flight, say, from Berlin to London. Now, that's not the case in the United States. There is a lot of competition outside the U.S., but not here. Um, we've seen with, um, with one airline, uh, wow airline I, and I think there's another one uh, you might have heard of um, Norwegian $99 to Europe 
try to find $99 anywhere in the United States. How long States. will that last? How is that sustainable? <laughs> well, that's, that's another thing. You have to have a competition, but we've seen what unbridled competition resulted in. In the 80s and 90s, it caused a lot of bankruptcies. So, so maybe there's an in-between model, but the fact is we have right now very little competition, and what's happened is service has gone down and air fares have gone up, and profits have gone to the roof for U.S. carriers. I have a feeling Sean has something to say. Well, about no, it's, that. It's, it's, so our, our, let's, let's, let's look at this by the numbers instead of the rhetoric. Um, the profit margin for the airline industry for the first quarter of 2018, 4.9%, which is a decrease from what it was last year. Let's compare it to other ones. Boeing, 12%. Disney, 24%. McDonald's, 36%. All great companies, all great products. Don't tell my wife about McDonald's, but it's, uh, they're great companies, and what, what they are deregulated, and they're offering a product that they're able to price at a point where they can make a profit and people will still feel that they're getting value. If they didn't want to buy a Big Mac, they wouldn't. If they thought the cost of a Disney ride, um, which is going up, was too high, they wouldn't go. If a carrier thought that they weren't getting a good deal from Boeing, they'd go to Airbus. Before deregulation, it was against the law for, the, for any U.S. carrier to fly between New York and L.A. for less than $1,400. That was the law. We all had to charge the same amount. How much is that now, 40 years later, in, in today's dollars? $1,400 in 2017 dollars. It's now $320. Um, Ten years ago, the top three carriers, American, United, Delta, had about 72% of the market. It's now at 52. That's 20 points drop. Where did that 20 points go? That 20 points went to new carriers offering new products in this deregulated world. The original low-cost carrier of Southwest, uh, niche players, hybrids like, Amer uh, excuse me, like uh, JetBlue, Hawaiian, Alaska. Then you have the ultra-low-cost carriers, ones like Spirit and Allegiant. They're all targeting different segments of the population. When you're making, when it costs $1,400 to go to California, you were not a low-income or family of four that was taking a casual trip. There's a reason why one-third of all passengers that are traveling now have annual income of less than $50,000, because you have this new product. Paul spoke about this. I hadn't seen this product that you were talking about, but the one where you're leaning back. And none of, none of A4A's members are ever going to offer that. But I can tell you, if, if, someone, if someone wants to offer it, if, if someone wants to ride it, then they'll make a dollar. Then they'll continue to exist. 99, if I went to you all and said, will you join me? I'm going to offer $99 service to Europe. I want you to... Um, invest in me, um, good luck. I don't think that's sustainable. We saw that in the airline industry when people would just do these rock bottom fares competing for market share. It wasn't sustainable. We finally have reached this point where we have a small profit. No one's getting rich yet, but a small profit which we're reinvesting in our personnel, more routes. We have the highest number of seats right now in small and mid sized communities in 10 years. Uh, excuse me. I don't know where all these numbers came from. DOT. But the, late, the latest uh, IATA figures. Uh, say that the U.S.-based carriers have half the profits in the world, only 20% of the traffic. Warren Buffett used to say airlines were a terrible investment. He now thinks they're great because they've got a big He's moat right. around them. I, I the, need to jump in here on the profit side. Sean, you mentioned that you have a 6 or so percent across-the-board profit margin. Mm -hmm. The way we look at it from airports, um, uh, you made last year $14 billion in ancillary free revenue, profit from change fees, from uh, bag fees, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, airports have no problem at all with, with airlines making money. We look at it as a healthy airline helps airports. Uh, but when we talk about modernizing airports, and we're talking about raising a, um, a minor fee, a user fee, to be able to pay for that without airports, airlines directly paying for it. Um, and when we're, pen, uh, we, we have $10 billion in needs per year for the next five years, uh, we have a shortfall and you're making 14 billion in profit. And the airline's response to that is, if you raise these fees to modernize American airports, people will stop flying. I would say the opposite. I would say if we create a competitive environment by modernizing American airports, we'll see more people flying. And the fee is not a tax. It's it's basically paid as a user fee. It's not the government doesn't collect it. Um, it's a fee paid by everybody in this room who travels, and it's a fee to be able to pay for the use of a public facility. Now, when I hear profits like that, I'm happy 
but when I look at the deficit that airports have in trying to modernize airports, um, one doesn't equate to the other. Well, you said profits. I know, it's, it's, I know we've got, I know, I know, Sean, <laughs> you wanna, we've got one though. Apparently the, uh, the question of seat size has captured the imagination of our audience. Um, but also <laughs> there is, there is with the new sort of all these new options, there are some questions about, you know, how you accommodate people. You know, not everyone is built the same. Some of us are very tall, some of us are very small. Um, and so what do you guys have, I'd like to hear what our panel has to say about accommodations for folks that have disabilities, um, how, you, how you sort of work with people who are tall. You know, will tall people just always have to pay more to get a seat that they can be comfortable in? What can airports and airlines do to help accommodate passengers that have special travel needs, older people? things like that. If we modernize our airports and are able to build them out, <laughs> we can build seats that are for big and small. I never have a problem on an airline because I'm only five foot eight, but I've sat next to people who are six foot five and I can see why they're uncomfortable. Maybe we could right. take some of these airport seats on the airplanes, but <laughs> until then, um, in, in 2015, we proposed, we thought it was a very reasonable proposal, which was to have a standard which would accommodate at least 90% of passengers not the way we'd like them to be, but the way they are. And for that other 10%, which at that time we, we felt were people over six foot two, over 250 pounds, um, you need to offer larger uh, seats. And you need to probably charge more, but proportionally more, not three to five times as much as what you, you have to go to to get to business class in many cases. Um, but that was that was rejected by the uh, the FAA, and um, so we're we're now back. Um, uh, the court rejected their rejection. Uh, we'll see where it goes, but that that I think is a is a reasonable solution. Sean, do you? Um, obviously, a big part of this is the need to upgrade our aircraft, and you have aircraft that were built. Um, some are you know 10, 12 years old. We can do a lot better than that. There are new technologies. Um, new designs, Boeing and Airbus are doing great things. One of the things that airlines do when they are profitable is reinvest in their product, either retrofitting the cabin, there's nothing like getting on uh, a plane in that new plane smell of a, of a 757. Um, but that is something, it's, a, it's an expensive investment. Airlines have stepped up as soon as we have become, now that we've become finally sustainably profitable, we have ordered a lot of new aircraft. We're taking out one new Boeing or Airbus aircraft online every day in the United States. It, those kinds of technologies have better seating, better options, better laboratory access for, for, uh, for disabled, um, and it's all part to try to improve the experience. Excuse me. And I'm, I'm sorry, I know we could talk more, which, is, which would be great, but we have to wrap it up. So I thank you all so much. This was a great discussion. Um, now we're gonna move on to our next panel, but thank you all and thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I wish we could have spoken longer.